Hi everyone, my name is Alice Gong and we are here at the historic Hawthorne Barn with Shayna Feinberg, filmmaker extraordinaire. Uh, she will be sharing her experience as a writer and a filmmaker with us and talk a little about what she's been working on this week doing her residency. Um, meanwhile, please do visit our website at 20summers.org, sign up for our newsletter, follow us on Instagram, and check out our new summer concert dates at Truro Vineyards. Uh, those tickets are going quickly. And now here's Shayna. Hello. Um, I just wanted to get out of the way that I am pregnant. Um, which means that my stomach and my lungs are all right here, so I get a little out of breath. So you'll have to bear with me. Um, and I have some notes. Um, so I'm Shana Feinberg, and I'm a writer and I'm a director. Um, and I had uh, originally titled this lecture, uh, Moving the Needle, How Filmmaking and Writing Can Change the World. And then I realized that no one knew the title except for me. So now you too know the title of my lecture. Um, and I wanted to first just kind of unpack moving the needle. Um, when I Googled it, I saw that it meant changing something to a noticeable degree. And at first I like totally freaked out because the idea of noticeable seemed like really big to me. And I was like, am I doing that? Am I moving the needle in a noticeable way? Like, am I changing the world with my stuff in a noticeable way? And then I started to realize that actually noticeable could be very small, it could be very big. Um, like I was thinking like, I originally imagined I would be standing, but like this is noticeable it's to go here. And then also like this is noticeable to go like way over here. So both of those things um, are noticeable. So if it freaks you out to have to think of doing something to a big degree, then I would say stop thinking about it like that and start thinking about it as making tiny little waves. And so once I thought of my work as making tiny waves, I was like, oh yeah, that's totally what I'm doing. I'm totally making tiny waves. And what's cool about tiny waves is that they can become bigger waves or they can inspire other tiny waves that then become bigger waves together, or they can meet up with other tiny waves. Um, but anyways, there's like a, a butterfly or a pebble in a pond metaphor, but I, I'm not gonna make that uh, today. But what I will say is that I feel very much like my stuff is, is creating these little ripples, and that's what's really exciting to me. So as a writer, I've gotten to write for The New Yorker, The, the New York Observer, Washington Post, and I write regular, regularly for um, The New York Times. And I wanted to first show a couple of my columns from The New York Times um, to show how just these little pieces that I get to do with my friend Julia Rothman. She's an illustrator. She illustrates them and I do the interviews and the writing. Just getting to do these little pieces together moves the needle and creates these small waves. So, Mike, can we show the first one? Is that cool? Yes. All right, I'm gonna read. Um, the first one I wanted to share is called um, red, white, and blue when you're black. And it came out last year for July 4th. Um, it's an interview that I did with a guy named Jitu Ma'at, who was 30 at the time. And he manages his father's Brooklyn hardware store called Hardware 2.0. Um, I'm going to read you some of this. So he said, Normally for the 4th of July season, I order grills, charcoal, mosquito repellent flags. Normally I sell 100 flags a month. Every year I order flags, but this year I didn't. I want people to know which side we're on, and that would be the Black Lives Matter side. The flag is a symbol of nationalism. It's a symbol of feeling patriotic, and at this moment in time, I don't feel like a real citizen of the U.S. I don't have the same pride about America that I had before. Am I going to celebrate July 4th? No. 
What's to celebrate? It's really not our Independence Day. This country doesn't really feel like our country. My dad owned this hardware store since 1989. He was renovating houses in the 1980s and realized there were no black-owned hardware stores, so he started his own. I've been working here for eight years. Because of COVID-19 and his pre-existing conditions and just being old, I've been keeping my dad home this whole time. We stayed open during Corona, normal business hours, but it's very, very, very hard to keep everything running smoothly. At first, we lost a lot of business because other local companies that used to come to us shut down. Recently, more people have been coming because they don't want to buy from Home Depot because they're a big Trump backer. But we've had no local or federal support. We applied for the PPP loan and the EIDL loan. We were denied the first and haven't heard back on the second. I was more naive than my father. I expected to get it. We did everything the right, right way, and we didn't get any assistance at all. So I'm not going to read the rest, but... Um, I wanted to share that piece because um, to me that piece felt like moving the needle. We were representing someone that you wouldn't normally get to read about in the business section of the New York Times. And I thought that his, you know, this was a thing that was definitely being written about in a very journalistic way that a lot of black owned businesses were being ignored for the, for the federal funding. But this felt really personal, and so to me it felt like this huge coup, or I guess a small coup, just to have his voice and his perspective, and for him to tie that to July 4th and American flags and all that stuff. I, I just felt like it was just a perfect encapsulation of, of what he was going through and what so many people were going through. And so I, I was very happy with that piece, and it felt to me like a small wave. Um, a thing that came out of that piece, which was really cool, was that afterwards he got hundreds of letters from people who were like basically either felt mad on his behalf or mad on their own behalf and could relate. Um, but it was just incredible to see, he took photos of all of these handwritten letters that he had gotten from all over the country of other people being like, I feel what you feel. So maybe in that case, it felt like a slightly bigger wave, like a moving the needle even further. Um, so that's kind of what I mean by writing can change the world. Um, it's a tiny corner of the world, but if we do that consistently, then it's gonna sort of, you know, compound. It's like, I guess, what they say about investing, um, that if you have like, I don't know anything about investing, but if you have like a dollar, then like later on you'll have more money. But the point is that if, <laughs> if we all like just kind of move the needle a little bit in a way that is more empathetic, less racist, less sexist, less, less uh, ageist, homophobic, xenophobic, um, then we'll just be living in a nicer world. So that... That was one piece I wanted to show. I've been doing dance videos over the pandemic, little things here and there. And I'll be like, what's my gender when I'm dancing? Like, is this what a man would do when he dances? Is this what a woman does? Like, What's your gender when you're doing anything else? I feel like I'm a, a masculine person, but my pronouns are her and she, but I probably in the non-binary zone, I guess. There was a period of time where I was trying to be a femme when I was younger. And I was not capable of that. Like I would spit, I didn't like wearing dresses. But I also like being sort of delicate and a dandy, so, or queenie or whatever. So it's a mix. It's a total mix. I was wearing sort of like tomboyish clothes, but like look, wearing makeup, having long hair. And then eventually I, I would say I transitioned to being butch. So I cut all my hair off and then it just kept getting shorter. The inner and outer matched more, I guess. My mom made me go to ballet class when I was little and I feel like all the girls that were doing it were like these blonde little girls that had all the right leotards and I would show up with just a leotard and no tights with like my legs hanging out and I felt so like 
uh, ashamed about that. And I'm like, I don't fit in. I'm like, eh, 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 eh. this certain type of girl does this. You have to, you know, and you move a certain way and you look a certain way. And But you've been dancing your whole life. Yes, yes. And when I used to break dance, there was this whole thing where I was the only girl in the contest of the break dancing contest. I won. And all of all the boys and told me it was because I was a girl was the only reason I won. They continued to do this thing called calling me out for months after, which is when you'd be standing in a dance circle watching and they'd come up to you and they'd like snaky point their finger at you to like be like, I'm challenging you to a dance off. And they would be like, I want your trophy. <laughs> and I felt like I was like dancing like one of the boys, I guess. Dudes, I feel like, are more restrained. It's obviously a lot has changed, but this is still ingrained that it's like you kind of have to like just rock back and forth or whatever. <laughs> you can't like put your hips too much or be too snaky. Like, what does a lady dance like? What does a lady dance like? I don't know if it was, that was, that's the thing. <laughs> like, is it like, I feel like the conclusion is just like everything else about gender is like, don't try and box anything in. It's just let yourself or let it be what it is. I'm just gonna keep doing the things that I do. I like, uh, I feel like a dude right now. Or then all of a sudden just jump and do like flowy wingy arms and be like, this is how I'm feeling. I just keep dancing. Um, there's this very famous quote from a famous old filmmaker who, uh, he said, um, there's shadows in life whenever anyone would criticize his lighting. Uh, so I, I say that at least a thousand times when I'm shooting anything. Uh, there's also technical difficulties in life, so we're happy to go with it. Um, Basically, that video that we were trying to play is called What's My Gender When I'm Dancing. Um, it features a very close friend of mine and a collaborator who I love, Dre Campbell. Um, and she talks about how during the pandemic, she's been um, doing all these dance videos. And um, sh she's been thinking, like, what's my gender when I'm dancing? And so I was like, well, what's your gender when you're doing anything? And her pronouns are she, her, but she is masculine presenting. So, um, you know, I guess she sees herself in a fluid manner. Um, and so once we started talking about that idea of like, well, what gender is she when she dances? It made me think like, well, what gender are any of us when we dance? Um, and I don't think you have to be someone who necessarily feels like your identity is fluid to feel like, well, I don't want to be pegged as this one specific thing when I'm doing anything, when I'm eating, when I'm walking, when I'm talking. Um, and she wound up telling us all these stories about dancing throughout her life and how she, she used to break dance and do break dance competitions and would be the only girl and didn't fit in. And then she did ballet and didn't fit in with those girls. So she's kind of had to like create her own identity um, and dancing has been a huge part of her life. And so making that video for me, it was just really an exercise. I wanted to make five to 10 short portrait docs of people and just kind of find the story as I went along. Um, Cause for me, I'm an indie filmmaker, which means that I'm outside the system. I don't need anyone to give me permission to make something or to tell me you can't do that because the person's not young enough or famous enough. Um, and so that's an exciting thing about being an indie filmmaker who makes things on a micro budget is that I can just go off and do something. So making that piece was really inspiring because it spoke to me, but then when we just uploaded it and like put it on Facebook or something, so many people also felt like, oh, that's me, that, that's how I feel, that represents my feelings. And so that felt like a small wave, again, connecting to all these other small waves and maybe somehow becoming a part of a larger wave. Um, so Mike, can we not show any clips, do you think? 
No, I don't want to show that one though. But I so before we show anything, I want to talk about. Um, so growing up, I was super influenced by all these movies made by men. Uh, very, very, very much influenced by a filmmaker who I will call Shmudi Shmalin, um, who has now been, he's, I mean, he's just a, a, not a good guy, uh, which I think has been kind of clear to people for a really long time, but it's only now in the last couple of years that that's like, he's been, you know, like we can, do, let's just take from him the pieces and and not really, we don't have to revere him as much, obviously. Um, but I think there's like a lot of pieces that uh, me and other filmmakers have taken and I think been inspired by, um, uh, I loved Rod Radha Blank's 41-year-old uh, or 40-year-old version. Um, that was an amazing film and she was clearly influenced by like Spike Lee and Cassavetes and also Shmudi Shmalin. Um, so I feel like it's kind of this time now where like women and people of color and all kinds of people who are not just white guys um, can take from what people like Shmody Schmelin did and be influenced by his, um, you know, his style, his shots and things like that. Um, so I was recently, last week I, I was shooting this short doc with my mom um, and when I was actually shooting it, I, you know, in the moment shooting with the, these long lenses and these kind of like slow zooms and I was shooting on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, which is where I'm from, where my mom lives. And I started to realize that I was like inserting myself and women into these movies that I had grown up with. Um, and it felt really cool. Like I was like, oh, like I'm taking this stuff that feels really canceled to me now because he's like such a bad person. And, um, and also like those movies, so many of them were like so incredibly sexist and racist, but there's these moments from them that I really liked, like these, these shots and these techniques, which I'm sure he got from other people. <laughs> um, but it felt really cool and somehow very empowering to be like on the Upper West Side and filming my mom with this long lens. And she's got like, she's 80 and she has kind of like stooped shoulders and she's like an old lady. And like, I don't know, I just was like, this is so cool. I'm like, instead of it being these guys, these nebbishy guys, these, you know, it's, it's centering someone else. And that felt awesome to me. Um, so I, I wanted to show some of that if we can. It's, now this is totally raw, like I have done, there's no color, there's no sound, there's no editing, there's nothing. So it's very flat looking, but I just wanted to show that um, to kind of show like, you'll see like there's these influences from these movies like Hannah and her sisters, um, like Manhattan Murder Mystery, like these, these movies from my youth and it's, uh, but I'm applying it now. I'm sort of decentering that nebbishy white guy, and I guess centering a nebbishy white lady. But um, but oh, you know, obviously, it, everyone should be centered. So, um, but this is for me. This is like another wave, of of another small wave of kind of moving the needle and and changing things just a little bit. So, can we play those? Okay, yeah, let's play the sidewalk first. Um, so each of these clips is like a minute. We'll just play the sidewalk one for now. Is it working? Yay! Okay. So if memory serves, <laughs> you're seeing like all of these real New Yorkers um, and cars and it's, it's a long lens. Um, it's the Upper West Side. I think someone has a bag that says like, I love New York or something. Um, so I don't know, I just, I really loved making it. And at that moment, that realization where I was like, oh, I'm inserting myself, inserting women, like that felt really cool. And I would encourage anyone to do that um, with anything they're making. Um, we're, 
that's we're good on that one okay great now something else came up while I was filming so a little backstory I think I'm doing fine on time yeah okay this is my this is my end this is the denouement I guess piece de resistance anyways so basically during the pandemic I didn't see my mom for two months and it was it was bliss no I'm just kidding um no I didn't see my mom for two months because she was 79 and I had a five-year-old at the time he's now six she's now 80 but like we thought we shouldn't see her and then eventually we saw her after two whole months of not seeing her and um I had been like slowly working on this movie about her called Mary's Third Act in which I was trying to get her to be fulfilled by the end of her life because so my dad died four years ago and like I'm sure he didn't want to die but he seemed pretty fulfilled like he seemed happy and good um and, and then he died whereas my mom who was a little bit older than him um never totally seemed fulfilled like she was a is a woman and I and had to give up her career and, and not because of my dad but she had been married prior and had a kid and then was a single mom and like you know I don't know I just felt like she wasn't that fulfilled and so I wanted to make this movie about my mom getting fulfilled but then the pandemic happened and that movie kind of got put on the back burner so instead I started just interviewing her about stuff and last September during one of these interviews she told me this very crazy story about how basically her mom had drugged her the night before her first marriage so that she would go through with it and she that night before she got drugged had made an eggplant sauce meal for her family and her husband to be's family and so I, I had this the last the last like seven months I've had this story in my mind. There's all these details. I won't tell you now, but um, I had that story in my mind, and I really wanted to go film my mom making this eggplant sauce and have that story be told over the footage. But, you know, what came out in the storytelling when I went to record my mom again was, like, how controlling her own mother was of her, her whole life. And... And it came out that, you know, she felt like she was just playing a part getting married to this first guy. And I don't know, it was just, it was very interesting. I, I really wanted to do something with the story. So I go up and I'm filming her with a very talented DP and really nice equipment. And as we're filming, I am like, I find myself con wanting to control my mom. Like she's my little doll, like. She wasn't doing the things that I wanted. She wasn't doing it right. You know, she would, like, do all these things the wrong way. Um, and so anyways, basically the piece has sort of begun to um, expand or become more complicated and become more like a Russian nesting doll where there's her story, but then there's also more than just that. Um, but the point is that I, I felt like in being able to be on this set, and see it evolve and realize that as as an independent filmmaker I can do that I can just choose to do that I don't have to go to a bunch of gatekeepers and be like can I change this a little bit and can I add some comedy in or can I add in this part where I'm yelling at my mom like it felt very freeing to me and it felt like you know again like to go back to the sort of metaphor of waves like it felt like oh this is another wave this is like me getting to create my own ripples um and do things my own way which is really inspiring and at times it can be frustrating because you want to work within a system because that feels like success but it also can be very freeing like in this instance um where I just feel like oh wait I don't have to do what a funder says I can do what I want to do because I'm making this I'm the one at the helm driving the car so I wanted to show two clips they're kind of can we we can show those right with sound action
two, three. Let's go back again in a little bit less reaction now. 50% of that. Was that one good? Yeah. All right. Cut it. Okay, we got it, Mommy. All right. So she keeps placing the dish. I wanted her to just place the dish and look to camera. But instead, she, like, places the dish and is like, like, she... She did it wrong every time. And I just wanted her to be natural. And she was being natural for her, but it was, like, not natural. It wasn't what I wanted. Anyways, the point is... Um, it, there was this real freedom in just like allowing that to happen and and capturing it and being like you know what this is this is the gold it's, the gold is not necessarily like the story of my mom my poor mom being dr drugged to get married which is maybe like um a bronze or maybe it's a silver I, I don't know it's fine that's good gold too but like the real gold i felt like was actually the relationship between these two women me and my mom it was also just that I could on a dime be like, no, this is the piece now, which I feel like probably is how a lot of like men in Hollywood feel. Although, I don't know, maybe they don't. But um, as a person who started out, I was, I was, I started out female. So when I, and I'm still female, but when I go onto a set to direct, sometimes I find that I have to like let all these men talk before me. Um, which is fine. Like, I think some people want me to shut them down and I sort of, like, wait for them to, like, lose their energy and then I take over. And also, I know I'm in charge in the editing room, so I don't have to use anything that they say. But the point is that being on this set and being, like, this woman and being in control of this old lady, who's my mom, um, felt like this amazing kind of freedom. And it felt like these are the, the waves that I want to make. Obviously, like, it's cool to get funding and to be successful in these sort of at you know have a seat at the table kind of way which is awesome um but it's also cool to be like I have my own table I'm making my own doing my own thing um and then you know maybe someday or some days they do some days they're like come sit at our table and then you leave your table for a little while and you go sit at their table but then your table's still there so if they're like the table's full now you can go back to your table okay the point is Thank you so much for, do, do, does Aziz ask me, do, are we good? Are we good? Okay. So thank you so much for listening. Um, I'm super excited about the small waves that I've been making. Um, I'm super excited for you and the small waves you're making. And like, hopefully someday our small waves will meet up and create bigger waves or tsunamis. Um, oceans of love. Oceans of love. Uh, yeah, so, um, basically, my whole thing is that it took me such a long time to be like, it's okay that I'm here, and I'm making things, and I'm making them my own way, and so, I just wanted to share with people, like, your voice matters, your perspective matters, um, hopefully you're not like a terrible sexist racist person listening, <laughs> but the point is, um, people, you know, do your thing however you can and in, and in whatever way that you can begin. Um, because it will make a difference, even if it's tiny. So, thank you so much.